All right. So part of the uh, member services is that you belong to the California Association of Realtors. Now, every market center, Calabasas, the West Side, Torrance, uh, Long Beach, or whatever KW office that you're located, you have a priority TC or transaction coordinator that provides you with these um, list of items that you need to properly include as part of the process. Now, this information is straight out of the California Association of Realtors. This is something that you can get once you uh, log in to uh, the California Association of Realtors. So let me uh, let me go back real quick. I apologize and see if I can go back here. All right. So part of the uh, California Association of Realtors, right here, where you can get this information and you can download this on a PDF file is right here from Transaction Center. Okay, or you can type it up right here and just type in checklist. When you type in checklist, it'll provide you the seller disclosure checklist, okay, the chart. And the sale disclosure checklist is designed to provide a realtor with a checklist style guide to determine which car form should be provided in their transaction. Now, here's the problem where I see a lot of agents get in trouble. One, they do not know what forms to be included, what uh, uh, documentations the buyer or the seller need to sign. And this is why you gotta make sure that you are talking to your market center, speaking with a broker, speaking with a team leader and getting some guidance if you do not know the uh, checklist of items. Keller Williams South Bay also has their in-house checklist and basically, we pulled things out of the California Association of Realtors, and then we implemented our different uh, uh, plan of uh, style for our office. Okay, so once you get to this section here, as I mentioned, it's a sales residential up to four units. Does not address the disclosure requirements of residential five plus, commercial, or any type of properties. The checklist addresses the general common disclosure required for one to four units, but does not cover all disclosures required by law. It doesn't uh, go into a lot of the details that we as company, because it can be a city report, um, it can be termite report, general home inspection report. Uh, these are in addition to what we have uh, with the California Association of Realtors. Now the California Association of Realtors also provides you with zip forms, right? which is your transfer disclosures, your SPQ, your AD, your P, uh, uh, your BRE, your uh, agency disclosures, and all the different 350 plus forms that the uh, California Association of Realtors provide you. But this is just a general comprehensive um, uh, detailed checklist that you can use as part of your arsenal of tools. This is something that I would definitely recommend if you're a newer agent or someone that doesn't do much uh, business to be aligned and get the latest information. Now, if you, uh, if, you, if you know that this information is currently as of May 24th, 24th 2021, all right? Now, certain transactions, including new homes, subdivisions, and common interest development uh, sales are subject to separate disclosures. And I wanna emphasize and stress the fact that this is only for SFR up to four units. If we're talking new construction, we're talking vacant home, excuse me, vacant land, um, uh, business opportunity, those are totally, totally different forms that you're gonna utilize, okay? So again, part of the uh, member service of the California Association of Realtors is it provides you with a guide and support and ultimately a uh, understanding of what you need to utilize for the purpose of closing the transaction. So let's go ahead and dive deep into the actual form here. Does everyone see the form? Can I get a yes? Yes. Thank you. All right, part of the cool thing about this particular checklist, as you can see, is it's statutory 
contractual required disclosures. Now, the cool thing is it tells you what disclosures and then additional information that you can uh, dive into as well. So in order to be a more efficient and more professional and really understand your role as a professional realtor is to educate, guide, and support your clients, the buyers, and also the, the sellers. So the cool thing about this checklist, it, it provides you with six pages of disclosures, okay? And we're gonna dive in into some of these that you probably were not aware that is part of the requirements. So the first one is the California Phone Code document name TDS. This is the acronym for the Transfer Disclosure Statement and the SPQ. They both align together. They're both part of the uh, disclosure of the seller to the uh, buyer. So the uh, Transfer Disclosure Statement and the Seller Property Questionnaire, they can also be uh, exempt. Okay, just as it reads right here, unless exempt, see uh, ESD plus uh, WHS below. So the cool thing is it gives you additional information regarding which form you need to utilize. Now this form obviously is coming from the seller as part of the seller's responsibility to provide no material facts about the property. These are conditions. Now, where I get a lot of confusion with agent is, you know, is this mean that the seller by disclosing has to do all these repairs or replace certain items? The answer is no. Okay, all we're doing is disclosing pertinent information regarding the condition of the home. At the end of the day, all properties are sold in as, as this condition, meaning that if a seller discloses to the buyer, here are the material facts. The roof is old and needs to be replaced. The AC comes in, sometimes cold, sometimes hot. The floors are on level. You gotta look into it. Plumbing backs up every once in a while. So as long as you disclose this to the consumer, the buyer, then you're, you're in the clear. It is up to the buyer to do their also their due diligence and properly guide their uh, position as well. Getting general inspections, contractors, plumbers, electricians, um, handyman, you know, give them a general idea of the condition of the property. But the responsibility falls on the seller to provide no material facts about the property. Although the uh, transfer is required in the residential one up to four transactions, there are a number of exemptions. Common exemptions include if the property is in a probate. So if you get a, a probate, a real estate owned property, better known as an REO, bankruptcy or some type of trust, then typically there is a transfer disclosure statement exemption form. And the cool thing is that you can just click on, on these uh, blue color coded uh, PDF files and it'll take you right into different articles and different folders as well. Now, the SPQ is required by contract under the California Residential uh, Purchase Agreement, whether the TDS is required or not. And when you submit an offer on behalf of your clients, your offer gets accepted, you're in escrow. Part of the seller's responsibility is to provide you with these disclosures, okay? Any questions regarding TDS and SPQ? All right, <clears throat> the next is what we call is the AVID, Agent Visual Inspection Disclosure. A visual inspection is required in nearly all residential one of four transactions. The AVID is a re uh, recommended California Association of Realtors form, but agents might, may also use third party page of the transfer disclosure statement to provide the results of their vis uh, visual inspection. Now, the AVID, if you are aware of it, an AVID is, as it's say, visual inspection. 
Meaning you're not going to wear a hard hat. You're not going to have a tool, uh, tool chest. You're not going to have a tool belt. You're going to be crawling underneath the house. You're not going to be going into the attic on top of the roof and doing these type of visual inspections. No, it's just looking at what you see in front of you as you're walking through the property. If you see a crack on the wall, right? You're gonna identify that on the abbot. If you see cracks on the floor, you're gonna identify that on the abbot. If you see stains on the ceiling, floors, or wall, you're gonna identify that on the abbot. Remember, it's an agent visual inspection. You're not gonna move furniture, you're not gonna move couches, you're not gonna move televisions, you're not gonna move washer and dryers, refrigerators to kind of see what's behind that, that appliance. That's not our job, that is not your responsibility. Okay, so I wanna be crystal clear of what an agent visual inspection really is, okay? And that's what it is, it's a visual inspection. Any questions regarding habits? All right, so let's continue. The AS, the QS, or the uh, AB, seller affidavit of non-foreign status qualify, qualify substitute for the buyer's affidavit. Now, most of this information, again, uh, are compliance with the FERPTA through the previous of a qualified substitute, meaning that if a, um, if a seller does not want to provide personal information, such as social security, they can utilize what's called a qualified substitute. And usually the qualified substitute is the escrow department that handles the escrow. They can substitute themselves as part of the process where the seller does not have to disclose social security information to the buyer because that's part of the process, okay? The seller affidavit is again an affidavit that they're not a foreigner and that they do pay taxes, property taxes as well. What the seller affidavit and non-foreign status basically states that if you're a foreigner that owns real estate in the US and you do not have a social security, then what, they, uh, what the government, government is doing is protecting themselves from the consumer selling the property pulling out the proceeds and not paying at the end of the year their taxes. So if a foreigner, and if you're in a transaction that involves a foreigner a seller, this is where the non-foreign status affidavit comes into place. So immediately ESCO will know that this is a foreigner, we're gonna withhold not just state taxes, but also IRS taxes for the sake of making sure that the seller pays what is rightfully uh, owed to the, to the state and also the IRS, okay? And it goes in and says, in practice, the AS is a usual uh, use to notify the buyer that the escrow will be providing an SQ. In certain circumstances, the buyer affidavit form AB may be used in lieu of both the AS and the QS, okay? Articles of federal withholding. So let's just go to this, uh, quick article, just to kind of give you an idea. The cool thing about utilizing the information from the uh, California Association of Realtors folks is the ability to know key questions. If you want to be very diligent and be better informed and be more in control of this conversation, then you got to arm yourself with understanding the dynamics of each and every form that is thrown at you. So here's a prime example of the federal withholding foreign investment in real estate property taxes. What is FERPTA? What is a foreign person? Must the seller provide his or her social security to the buyer in order to be exempt from withholding? Under the FERPTA fixed law, can the seller give the seller an affidavit including his or her social security number to escrow or title and only not to the, uh, to the buyer. These are general questions that these forms provide you. The cool thing about this is Q&A folks, 
And again, the, the importance, and I have to stress the importance of educating yourself and knowing that you have all this arsenal of information right at your fingertips, okay? Utilize what you're paying as part of the member service. This is for you folks, okay? And I wish, I wish there was more people on the call because we get it all the time. Simon, where do I get more information about this? What does this mean? What does that mean? I am not understanding what this form indicates and what we need to do. Here is the sources that you can uh, find. It talks about what is FERPTA. The cool thing, it's a Q&A right here. And then the answer to that question is right here. It is a foreign investment in real estate property tax act since January 1st of 1985, the act has required that a buyer withhold 10% of the gross sale price and send it to the Internal Revenue Services, better known as the IRS. If the seller is a foreign person, the term foreign person has a very specific meaning and can be misleading. See question number four. On February 17 of 2016, the withholding amount increased from 10 to now 15%. However, if the property acquired is to be used as the buyer's residence and the property's price is less than $1 million or less, then the 10% withholding rate will apply. There are a number of exemptions from the withholding requirements and special rules, see page three. Pursuing to the uh, Protecting American from Tax Hikes Act of 2015, signed by law by the President in December 18, 2015, this provision is effective 60 days after the enactment. What sales are covered under the FERPTA? What are the exemptions under FERPTA? What is, uh, who or what is a foreign person? Okay. A foreign person is a non-resident alien individual or a foreign corporation that has not properly made an election to be treated as a domestic corporation or a foreign partnership trust, the state, or entity. As a rough guideline, an individual is not a foreign person if he or she is a United States citizen, is a resident alien holder of a green car, uh, green car that has not been revoked or meets the substantial presence test. Some of the individuals may be used person as not foreign person as well. A more technical definition of foreign person, including a substitute present test, appears on the reverse side of the California uh, standard forms. Okay, so it goes on and on and on. There's a series of a lot of Q&A. My uh, objective to this would be is print all this information, folks and put it into a three ring binder as an avenue where you can reference and go back if you don't want to navigate a lot of this information online. I, uh, when I started in real estate, that's what I did. I got a three by uh, a three ring binder and I just started printing things that were pertinent to my business, but more so, so I can go back and reference. You know, if a question comes out about FERPTA, what is FERPTA? Gosh, you know what? I remember hearing it, but I don't know where to go on the internet. There you go. You can have these type of forms, hard copies on a three ring binder, and you can reference that as FERPTA. You can uh, alphabetically order, put these forms. If it's affidavit, um, if it's a, uh, a trust, you put it on T. If it's a FERPTA, you put it in F. So that's the real cool thing about understanding and getting a grip on, on disclosures. The other is your natural hazard disclosure as well, guys. And again, all this information can be provided right from the fingertips of the National Association, or excuse me, the California Association of Realtors. What is the NHD disclosure uh, report? <laughs> so the natural hazard disclosure statement, the CAR contract requires a natural hazard zone disclosure reporting, including tax. It also enables the seller to comply with the obligations to disclose whether the property is within a hazard zone. 
Now the NHG report is usually by a third party company, SNAP NHG, uh, Fidelity uh, NHG. There's a lot of uh, companies that provide uh, what we call these third party uh, reports. Now, what is an NHD? An NHD is basically anything outside of the subject property. If the property falls under a uh, airport ordinance, let's just say that your home is near or around LAX, and you know that LAX has domestic and also international flags 24 seven. If the property falls within the parameters of a one mile, two mile, three or five mile radius of LAX, guess what? That is part of the natural hazard disclosure. Why would that be a natural hazard disclosure? Well, what, is, uh, what does planes have in order for them to be up in the air? They have jet fuel. Jet fuel eventually burns. And if you are on the uh, path of landing or takeoff, you're most likely probably gonna get some type of order, some type of sound, uh, and some type of maybe vibration. No difference than your home being around a freeway, okay? Prime example, my parents live right next to the freeway, next to it. Their backyard, you can see their freeway. If my parents were to uh, decide to sell their property, part of the natural hazard disclosure would say that the home falls under the area of the uh, freeway. Why is that important? Because part of the material fact is maybe someone doesn't want to live near or around the freeway. Okay. And obviously common sense, right? When buyers are submitting offers, they should know the area that they're submitting offers and they're going to know and understand that the freeway is right behind the property when they're actually previewing the home. But you still got buyers that will sue for non-disclosures. Well, I didn't know that that was the freeway. How can you not know? It's right behind you. You can hear the traffic, you can hear the semi trucks and you can see the pollution but you still get people that will sue you for non-disclosures. Again, no difference than the FERPTA, a lot of Q&A. What are the general requirements of the natural hazard disclosure? What transactions are subject to NHD laws? What transfer of one to four unit residential property are exempt from the requirements? What is the difference between NHD statement and NHD report? Very good question. What information does the NHD contain? Third party disclosure. Once the seller provides a complete NHD to the buyer, does the buyer have a three day uh, right of uh, residual uh, similar to the transfer disclosure? The answer is yes, absolutely. Unless the NHD is delivered to the prospecting buyer before the buyer signs the contract. In other words, for the purpose of right of residual, and NHD is treated exactly like a transfer disclosure statement. Under California Civil Code Section 1103.3, uh, subsection C as in Charles. Can the NHD statement be delivered, uh, where am I, delivered ed uh, electronically? The answer is yes. All right, so Cal Bus's office as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Does CAR have an app? The answer is yes. That's a very, very good question. The, uh, the California Association of Realtors does have an app. Uh, let, me, let me check real quick. Thank you for, uh, for bringing that, but I believe that they do. Let me just check. Because I know I have the app. So what the California Association of Realtors has is what's called the legal uh, hotline. So I don't know if you guys can see my, my phone, but if I was to go into my real estate apps, I have where it says legal hotline. Not sure if you can see, can, I, can someone say yes? Can they see this? Yes? Yes. Okay. So there is no, uh, 
and there might be an app, but the closest one is the legal hotline where you can click. And this is a great uh, app to have because you can go again, part of the California Association of Realtors, right? You put in your username and password and it'll give you series of different type of topics, disclosures, lawsuits that you can. Just go to your app store if you have an iPhone and just type in the California Association of Realtors. Thank you. Thank you for uh, asking that question. All right, so let's go, uh, let's go back real quick and go back to the forms. Again, why is this important to, for you to know and understand? Is because when you start doing more and more real estate transactions, you're gonna be more acquainted and it's all gonna be systematically in your mind. I know TDS has to be there, the SPQ. And you're not gonna remember each and every disclosure that you need to provide. This is why you have a transaction coordinator. This transaction coordinator should be on top of all of your forms so you're not missing any of the information, okay? But the cool thing is you have all the resources on top of having your broker, your team leader, uh, maybe a productivity coach, uh, a mentor. These are all people that were here to help support, guide you, and give you the implementations to really anchor your position and ultimately have the compelling position to have that confidence that here are all the uh, forms that the seller has to provide to the buyer. And these are all the uh, disclosures that the buyer has to have as part of the initial process. Because let's be honest and let's be frank. Does anyone like to be sued? No, no one likes to be sued. Okay, but this is the, this is the unfortunate position as real estate professional because there's so many people involved in the transaction and the amounts of uh, money that gets moved around from price points to deposits to commissions that people you know, tend to uh, wanna fight and argue. So how do you protect yourself in the overall position when representing either parties, the buyer or the seller, is having paper trail. And the paper trail are these uh, disclosures that protect not just the agents, but also the buyer and the seller from a potential dispute. Now, if there's a dispute, there's nothing that we can do about that. We just gotta ride the wave and make, making sure that we properly uh, handled any and all disclosures and we got the signature and uh, 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 initials from the uh, consumer, okay? All right, let's skip a little bit. Obviously, just gonna go quickly. Megan's Law database, obviously part of the uh, RPA, the purchase agreement, there's a section there that talks about, you know, if the buyers are concerned about any sex offenders in the local area, subject property is in the city, I don't know, Los Angeles, city of, Calabasas as an example, you know, can they get additional information of any known sex offenders? Well, in the RPA, it provides you with the link of information where the uh, consumer can log in, type in the address, and right there, it'll provide you with a uh, general area scope, either one mile, five mile radius, of the subject property to find out if there's any sex offenders. Now let's be honest and transparent here. Most areas, it doesn't matter if you're in Beverly Hills, if it's uh, Brentwood, it doesn't matter. There is going to be registered offenders on these uh, sites within a mile radius. Because if you really think about it, let's just say that the property is right here, one mile radius, is going to cover a pretty large span. So, you know, unfortunately, you're, you're probably going to fall under that category where there's going to be offenders on that website. I was even surprised many, 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 many years ago, I was out of curiosity. I uh, typed in the, uh, the address of my parents. And to my shock and my surprise, our neighbor right in front, the neighbor where my parents had lived there for many, many years was a registered offender. 
And the funny part of it, it provides you with the crime and provides you what, you know, felony or misdemeanor conviction. And it also provides you with a snapshot of a photo. It has to be a current photo of the individual. So I was like in total shock because I talked to the guy every time I would go visit my parents. And when I would visit my, uh, my parents, I would think, oh, this guy, you know, unfortunately was registered as an offender. And, you know, sometimes it's very sad because these are usually underage people that, uh, you know, they're having, you know, these type of uh, 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 crimes commit. Now, we don't know a lot of the stories behind it, but it's still kind of eerie to know that there's people that are registered and fall within, you know, the subject property. And again, this is again part of the process because you don't want a buyer to buy a property and realize, oh my God, my neighbor right in front of me, right to the right side of me, right to the left side of me, you know, is, uh, is a registered offender. I would not have bought this property. This is why the purchase agreement clearly says that Megan's Law provides a database of disclosure to the consumer to please seek out. Now it's up to the buyer to go out and do their, what we call their due diligence. And part of the due diligence folks is for them to make sure that they are perfectly fine with continuing in the process of the home. Once they sign off on it, the initial, what they're saying is they acknowledge and they understand what they're signing off. Even if they do not go into the website they cannot use that as an avenue to say, well, I did not know. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you signed off on page four of the purchase agreement indicating of Megan's Law that you have the, uh, the ability to go into the site and see if there was any, any uh, offenders. And if you were not okay with that, then you shouldn't have signed off on the contingency removal of seller disclosures. Then you should have never bought the property. That would be our ground and our position. So again, this is why it's very, very important folks to understand why it's uh, uh, good to know these disclosures and more so you know, having a, 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 what I call a grip on, on these uh, forms. Obviously the AD form disclosure regarding agency disclosures, the BIA buyer inspection advisory, <clears throat> the PRPS possible representation of more than one buyer and seller. This is a good one to really know and understand. This form is a pre-check uh, check, uh, attachment on the RPA. It's already telling you that when you draft the purchase agreement folks, what it's telling you right there and then is that Hey, part of the initial process, uh, this possible representation of more than one buyer and seller is included and the buyer needs to sign off on it. But the cool thing is when you click on this form, it provides you with this listing representing seller only, dual agent, selling agent representing buyer only, okay? <clears throat> and the awesome thing is, again, you can print this information. Okay, you can print right here. And there you go. <clears throat> you can save it as a PDF, put it into your desktop or create a file. You can change this. And again, part of the arsenal of uh, tools that you wanna have in your tool chest is stuff like this, okay? I don't care if you have 30 years of experience. I don't care if you have 40 years of experience. Guess what I do? I do a lot of research. I'm not going to know each and every element of any of these forms. This is why I go back to referencing and getting what I need so I get better educated. And more so, I am armed with the necessary tools so now I can have a compelling conversation with either the buyer or the seller. Okay. So the listing agent representing sellers only. What? Disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship confirming 
real estate agency uh, uh, agency relationship. So it tells you the what, who, when, how, and and uh, and the law itself. <clears throat> Any, any questions regarding this particular form? All right, let's continue. All right, so additional information. If the seller is exempt from uh, signing off on the TDS, then it says then you add this form, which is the uh, ED and the WHS form, exempt seller disclosure, and also the water heater statement of compliance. For those that are exempt from this transaction, neither the TDS nor the SVQ is required to be delivered. Instead, the seller will provide what is called the exempt seller disclosure. What is this form? Is when the property falls under a trust. Example of something that falls under a trust is husband and wife pass away. There's a living trust that was created by the, the uh, the husband and the wife prior to their death. And part of the uh, trust says, after we pass, these are the instructions that I lay upon one of the children. Typically, it's usually the older son or daughter, but I've seen circumstances where it can be the youngest sibling as well. Usually the more responsible person to handle all of the, uh, all of the parents' affairs after they pass away. These are just written instructions of what I want for uh, the assets and uh, all the uh, personal property uh, and personal items to be included of what my direction of what I want. And when that's the case, then they are exempt from certain disclosure because remember the uh, transfer disclosure <clears throat> and the seller questionnaire form says, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, tell us what's wrong with the property. Well, if the sellers are no longer uh, living, then no one really knows the overall condition. Now, with that being said, I want to be very crystal clear in my position because I've seen circumstances that go sideways, especially if the successor to that trust is a child a child that knows the condition of the property. Even though they may be exempt, but they can also put a little bit of a scenario that if they hire a good attorney, that attorney is going to dissect this information. And this is something that may happen. Well, I know that you're the successor to the uh, trust but you are the, uh, the son of the deceased Mr. and Mrs. Casares. Is that correct? Yes. Now, your parents, before they, uh, they passed away, have lived in the property for 35 years. Is that uh, fair to say? Yes. Now, Simon, how old are you? Okay. I'm uh, 25. Okay. So at any given time in your childhood, did you ever reside on the property? Yes. Now, living in the property, I'm assuming you had your own bedroom. Is that fair to say? Yes. You shared common walls? Yes. You shared the garage? Yes. You, you shared the bathrooms? Yes. You pretty much walked around the property and know pretty much what was going on in the property. Is that fair to say? Yes. So at any given time, was there any issues with the property while living there? Yes. Can you explain some of the things that were um, happening in the property? Well, what do you mean? Have you ever had a water leak? Oh, yes. Have you ever had a roof issue or water uh, a roof issue leak? Oh yeah, I remember that in 2001, uh, my parents ended up uh, replacing the uh, roof. Okay. Have you ever uh, noticed any termites or termite service done on the property? Oh, that's right, yeah. So technically speaking, what I'm hearing, Simon, is yet 
you do know that there were certain things done to the property, replacement, upgrades, permits, contractors, uh, anything and everything regarding the property. Yeah. So therefore, I'm, I believe that you probably would have known any material facts regarding this property. Well, I didn't live in the property at the time of sale. That's not the question. The question is, did you know that there was issues with, regarding this property? And here you go, folks. That may be a pillar and a position that can dissect this and open up the can of worms. I'm not saying that's going to happen bullet by bullet, but what I'm saying is that can happen if you're faced to be and in position to be in that responsibility as part of the trust. So you got to be very, very careful. So even though you may be exempt, I would highly, highly recommend if you know about the property, even though you never lived in the property or you said, well, it's been 20 years since I lived in the property, I can only tell you what I remember. And that's okay. I'd rather put something there that you can utilize for the purpose of material fact than say, I don't know, I don't remember. No, 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 no. But in essence, you do know. Here's another one that we see a lot, you know, especially if you've had pets. I know <clears throat> I've owned pets and I know I have a pet cemetery at my parents' home. Now I'm the successor to my parents' trust. God forbid something happens to my, to my folks, I will be in charge of all of their assets, okay? But I also know if I ever have to make the decision of selling their home in the future, even though it has happened many, many, many years ago, I'm going to put as material fact, yeah, there's a pet cemetery behind. We have buried dogs in the backyard, okay? And just in my jotted memory, I know there's probably four pets behind my parents' home. I know because I was the one doing the dirty work. I didn't know any better. You know, I was just a kid. But there you go, folks. You don't want to be surprised. And these are just small things that can lead up to big things. Because there's a lot of people that unfortunately believe in these so-called, what's the word? Uh, they're very superstitious. And there might be people that seen the movie Pet Cemetery, right? <laughs> and may not want to buy the property if they know that there is pets. But I'd rather disclose it and say, hey, just to be, just to be clear, yeah, we, we buried you know, a couple of dogs back there. So you know, if you ever do any construction or start digging up, you know, don't call the police saying that we were you know, hiding things. I'd rather disclose certain, certain things similar to that. And people sometimes don't even think about the small things. But I'm the type of person that likes to think and overthink things. Just again, as an FYI, okay? Any thoughts, questions, or concerns regarding disclosures? All right. Well, let's go ahead and continue. <clears throat> Here's additional home, uh, homeowner guide to earthquake. Uh, if it's commercial. And the cool thing it tells you if the, if the bill was before 1960. If the home was built prior, uh, uh, before 1960, then you must provide a residential earthquake disclosure. If the home was built in 1960, as an example, then there is no need to provide this disclosure. If the home is a new construction, home was built in the 80s, home was built in the 90s or early 2000, then it's exempt from providing this guide to earthquake uh, disclosure. But again, going back to going into the blue section here, if you click on this, it'll take you to an additional site that provides you with additional information. Okay. And again, part of the cool thing is you just go to the print section. Okay, you, you, get, you get my drift here, or you can save it as well as part of your arsenal. I don't know what's going on here with the uh, print, but you get, you get the point. All right, let's uh, quickly continue. <clears throat> um, 
HOA, common uh, mandatory for uh, HOA. If you're doing seller financing, very rare right now because of low interest rate, we don't really see sellers doing any type of carry back or seller financing, but the form is there if need be. Private transfer, title insurance, supplemental taxes, FHA or HUD owned property, okay? Other available advisory and disclosures. Your SBSA, State Buyer and Seller Advisory. This is a 14-page risk management ad, uh, advisory uh, that the California uh, Association of Realtor recommends, including in every transaction. I love this form, the Market Condition Advisory. This form is used to document that a broker discussed with a buyer that the market condition fluctuates. Now, ladies and gentlemen on the call right now, as we speak, isn't it a crazy market right now? Multiple offers, way above asking, release contingencies, okay? What this form does, it provides the consumer with that disclosure. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, be aware that the condition of all offers being considered can fluctuate that if it's listed for $1 million doesn't mean that it's going to sell a million dollars. It can mean that it can sell for more 1.2, 1.3. So the cool thing is how do you have the conversation with the uh, consumer? Here you go. The market condition advisory, you know, buyers be aware that the condition fluctuate as a result, there is no guarantee that the price will continue to move in the direction you want. It also advises on the risk of making non-contingent offers or removing contingency votes. Great form to be part of your disclosures. Now, if your market center um, has a checklist, this is part of the requirements, folks. I highly, highly recommend, but again, Knowing the arsenal of information is crucial. Crucial. The wire fraud advisory. What are we seeing a lot right now? <clears throat> wire fraud. This form is an advisory to buyer and seller regarding the need to exercise extreme caution when using wire transfer of funds. When do you wire money? You wire money when you're submitting your final uh, closing <clears throat> ready to... Uh, close on the uh, buyer's transaction. The escrow and the uh, lender uh, gather all the necessary calculations, down payment, closing cost, and then they'll tell the, uh, the uh, buyer, hey, you gotta wire this amount into escrow so that would be close successfully. And the importance of understanding of fraud, people hack into emails and may, uh, assume the, the, the role of an escrow officer and telling your client the buyer. I remember a couple of years back, we had a scenario, it didn't happen to our escrow company, but it happened to an escrow that we uh, know very well. And they ended up wiring $375,000 of seller's proceeds to a buyer or, or someone in Texas which was not the seller. And it was an oversight on the escrow officer because someone was playing the part of the buyer, or excuse me, the seller. And the escrow officer was communicating with the seller saying, hey, you know, I want you to wire the money to this account, uh, Bank of America account number, uh, routing number. And they were having an, an instant conversation and we, we got copy because a police report was uh, done. A FBI fraud uh, was done as well. And ultimately it took several months for the insurance to kick in. Even though they were able to hold half of the money of that $325,000, half of that money was, was gone. The, the people that committed the fraud were able to pull that money out before they completely uh, blocked that account or wire. 
The problem here is that the escrow officer and the seller, the a real seller did not uh, respond immediately. I think it was two to three days after when they realized, oh shoot, we, we have a problem. And by that time, the money had already been wired to an account out in uh, Texas and someone was able to pull that money out. Unfortunately, half of that money. So the escrow company was responsible. The uh, seller was uh, going, uh, ended up getting an attorney representing uh, the uh, seller and wanted damages, you know, cause they needed the money to uh, buy their next property. They didn't have the enough uh, money to do so. So it was a big, big mess. Thank goodness it was in our in-house escrow. Uh, because that's a big check we had to write or, you know, would have had to write. So again, this is the reason having these forms to protect you as the agent, but more so uh, to protect the consumer as well. Okay. <clears throat> and it goes on and on and on with the different other uh, additional forms as well. Buyer's inspection waiver. This form is used to document that a buyer has been advised to obtain certain inspection, but has declined to do so under the under the broker's advice. Buyer's material issue advisory, a great form to know. Water cons uh, conservative plumbing fixtures. Six part uh, disclosure packet. Buyer's homeowner association advisory. Trust advisory, REOs. Wildfire design, uh, disaster advisory. Salary advisory. Property visit and open house advisory. This is another good form that I think was important that just came out maybe a couple of years back, the square foot and lot size advisory. Then this again goes to all buyers. This form is an advisory related to the possibility that there may be different measurements for square footage and lot size. It is, uh, uh, it recognizes that there may be a discrepancy and advise that the buyer to do their own investigation. There is a chart to provide the various different measurements that the parties may be aware of. How many times have you uh, been on the multiple listing service and the multiple listing service says that the house is 1500 and when the appraiser goes out there, they measure the home in essence, it's not a, uh, a 1500 square feet, but in essence, it's 1200 uh, square feet. And it's a 200, 200 square feet di uh, um, a discrepancy, okay? This is why we, we say to the buyer, you know, please, please, please make sure that you do your due diligence because the information from the listing agent may be coming from the uh, <clears throat> assessors and the assessors may not have all their information correct. I've seen where square footage and loss size do not match. And then ultimately the buyer's responsible to go out and do their due diligence because this form provides the buyer with the known disclosure that allows the, uh, the buyer to know, hey, there may be a discrepancy on the size of the uh, home and then the size of the, uh, of the land, of the uh, lot of cells. So here's a, again, an, a, a sample of what we have now. Let me also share with you part of uh, our KW resources, okay? This is our uh, resource. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So part of our resources here, folks, is the uh, the avenue and the ability to be able to get information. You just go to more, you go to resources, and then here is what we have our checklist. Now we have our broker checklist for the KW office, but the cool thing is that even if it's your office in Calabasas, you can go to your Calabasas, your West Side, LA Harbor, coastal properties. Let's just go to Calabasas website. You go under uh, resource and then you go down to transaction checklist. And here is um, the buyer's uh, checklist here. I believe this is for Calabasas. So let me, let me just show you. So again, 
The cool thing is that all market centers that fall under the uh, uh, the four offices here, we share our information. Here's the buyer's checklist of all the documents that are required. Okay, this is Keller Williams, Keller Williams South Bay. The cool thing is you can print, you can download this, and here are some of the uh, forms that we use from the listing from the buyer from in contract when you're in escrow, open escrow, escrow documentation, mandatory disclosures, reports, termite, all inspections, specific city ordinance, retrofits and building reports, request of repairs, other forms, and then obviously the coronavirus, which a lot of these are uh, no longer needed. So we definitely have to update our appropriateness. But again, the cool thing is because you're tapped into uh, the KW resources, you have uh, the ability to do so. LA Harbor, same thing, go to resource, <clears throat> go to office checklist, and go to lease, post files, and here you go, folks. We'll just show you LA Harbor as an example. And again, it's just click, click, and uh, download it or print it for your resources. What did I say earlier? Keep an arsenal of different uh, documents. <clears throat> are these forms in DocuSign already? Um, they probably are under the TC. If you are working with the transaction coordinator folks, then yeah, they can probably get all these taken care of for you. This is the whole purpose of having a transaction coordinator. Do what you're good at. Let the, uh, let the paper work be done by the uh, transaction coordinator. So here's uh, LA Harbor's uh, closed file checklist. Again, maybe the, the platform is a little different, but the information is all pretty much the same. Okay? Any, uh, any questions? Hi, can you actually tell me one more time where I can find those uh, disclosures? Uh, I was trying to go to the uh, KW Calabasas website and uh, I don't see the link for resources, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let, me, uh, let me share my computer real quick and I'll show you. Thank you so much. So, all you have to do is open up your browser, right? You're, you're gonna type in, uh, I'm just gonna use South Bay, for example. Just type in Calabasas. Uh, I think it's Cass. Calabasas, uh, I think it's Calabasas Hub. I'll check right now. But I'm gonna just use uh, South Bay as an example, right? Can you see this? Yes, I can. Okay. So let me go to Calabasas real quick. All right. So here you here you go. So Calabasas, if you can, and I'll put this on the on the chat. Copy, chat, click. Okay, I just sent you the link on the chat for you to click on, and then it'll take you to the Calabasas. So once you go to kwcalabasashub.com, it'll take you to the Keller, Keller Williams resource site, okay? From here, you can go to the leadership here or your leadership people. Okay. And then here you can go to resource, click on checklist under office compliance. Okay. okay. Disclosures. Here are some of the disclosures. That's great. Thank you. Okay. And then your checklist is right here commercial checklist, commercial lease checklist listing checklist, mobile home checklist, new construction, residential uh, buyer's checklist, residential lease checklist, vacant uh, land checklist. And you can download all these forms, okay, as part of your initial process. Okay, you just double click on it. <clears throat> Let it load up a little bit. And before you know it, it'll populate the form, okay? Yes, thank you so much. My, my pleasure.
And here you go, the new construction SFR 104 checklist. Here are all the forms that are required as part of the new construction form. Cool. All right, team. Well, I definitely appreciate you uh, hanging in there. I hope this uh, information was of value to you. And if you have any questions, by all means, uh, please reach out to me or your team leader or your broker for additional help. Okay. Thanks again. Appreciate you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. Stay, uh, stay safe and healthy out there. We'll see you on our next class. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye.